Uh, but I want to start um, by taking a strategic look at team philosophy uh, as they enter not only the draft, but free agency as a whole and, and see what kind of clues we can learn from where teams head space is at uh, following some of the transactions that we've seen. So by the way, the Ravens, the number one seed Bucky in the AFC a year ago, have ended up with the easiest strength of schedule in the entire NFL. Again, that based off last year's regular season finish for all the teams that they're scheduled to play. So how about that? Uh, and not only that, but they have one of the best off seasons by most accounts that we saw in the entire NFL. So what did you learn about the Ravens organizational philosophy um, by seeing the players that they targeted in free agency and then by the way they moved, they moved up and down the draft board? Uh, I think the Ravens are a team that subscribes to the theory of being building strength on strength, meaning they took where they were really, really uh, good at, where they were dominant at, and they continue to add to that. So in the draft, adding J.K. Dobbins to a backfield that is already loaded with Mark Ingram, uh, Gus Edwards, you have Lamar Jackson being able to pull and keep running read options. So then you get J.K. Dobbins to go with that mix. This is a team that should be able to run over anybody. And then when you go to the other side of the ball, because I felt like the Ravens reacted to the way the Tennessee Titans kind of beat them up that last game where Derrick Henry ran through them. They were more physical than the Baltimore Ravens, and they basically hit the bully in the mouth. Well, the Ravens have now countered by being building a bigger defensive line. Calais Campbell coming over, Derrick Wolf being a part of the rotation. They're beefier, they're stronger, they're stouter. They should be better equipped to deal with teams that kind of run right at them. And so I think Eric DaCosta and, and, and John Harbaugh did a great job of assessing their team and trying to stretch it out to make it even better going forward. Yeah, I think uh, you know you touched on that in uh, your scouts notebook on NFL.com. Uh, still up there for uh, everyone to go check out. I think that's a great point about strength on strength. I'm glad you got into that. I think we, we often see that manifest with the Ravens you know, definitely saw it this year, but in years past, they they have made an absolute commitment to upgrading and continuing to fortify the front seven on defense. Um, and I think that's that's important to note. I mean, you go all the way back. I mean, Brandon Williams, third round pick, Timmy Jernigan, second round pick the next year. They are preparing for the present and winning now, but also continuing to look ahead to the future. Okay. If we lose, you know, if we lose Timmy Jernigan, uh, if we decide we have to trade him away, do we have someone else in the pipeline coming up? They mm -hmm. did it when uh, Terrell Suggs was kind of winding down, drafting Matthew Judon and, you know, and then, you know, franchise tagging him, Zadarius Smith leaves and they just, they keep having guys that can step in and fill those holes. And again, we saw it in free agency with the Calais Cam Campbell trade. And then also with the, um, uh, with the signing of Derek Wolf. So I think that's an important one uh, as well. So uh, were there any other teams uh, strategy that kind of jumped out to you uh, as you could see as a, as a reaction to something that they faced in the regular season a year ago or in, er, to address an area of weakness? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things that Dallas Cowboys did that shows kind of like a signal in the change of how they're going about building their team. Um, we can talk about players over system. We can talk about taking the best available player. The one thing that the Cowboys did is they really made an attempt to add as many blue chip players to their roster as they could. And we can talk about it in the draft because C.D. Lamb is the obvious one. C.D. Lamb wasn't necessarily a guy that they needed in terms of a position need, but he was the best player that was available for them. And they add him to a lineup that has Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup. In the second and fourth round, they took two corners. Trayvon Diggs and Reggie Robinson II to give them length, to give them guys that can press, but also guys that have ball skills. Bradley and I gives them a pass rusher. But I think the Andy Dalton uh, signing is the one that really kind of mm. opened my eyes to how they're doing it because the backup quarterback position is one that's tricky, right? It's tricky because do you go with a developmental guy, someone that you can kind of develop and maybe he never gets in because he gets limited reps in practice and we're trying to develop him for two, three years down the line? Or do we get a veteran quarterback, a legitimate player, a guy who is experienced, who has a high IQ, who can take information from the board to the field with limited reps and still has enough game to win and to win four or five games if he has to play? We saw the New Orleans Saints benefit from that with Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy Bridgewater went 5-0 and when he stepped in for Drew Brees. That enabled them to be able to kind of go on and secure a playoff spot. 
Well, now with Andy Dalton and the Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys should feel better about their backup quarterback situation if Dak Prescott gets hurt or if it's an extended contract impasse. It gives them an opportunity to hit the ground running with a quarterback who has a lot of pills on the wall. Yeah, I think that's an interesting discussion because I, I think back in, in recent NFL history, I feel like the value of the backup quarterback really came into play first when Tom Brady went down uh, in 2008. Mm -hmm. And we saw Matt Castle come in and guide the Patriots to an 11-win season, although they didn't make the playoffs. And then a few years later, uh, I believe 2011, coming out of the lockout when Peyton Manning was dealing with the neck injury with the Colts, he ends up having to sit out the whole season, and that team absolutely falls apart with Curtis Painter and the like, right? Awful. Yeah, yeah. awful. Absolutely awful. Makes you wonder, you know, what would that team have looked like with Peyton at the top of his game, right? Um, you know, gosh, it, was he really responsible so much so for the Colts' success in, in those times? So that, that was something, you know, that we kind of saw, all right, the evolution of this. And then, of course, most recently with the Philadelphia Eagles, who had Carson Wentz on an MVP season. And he gets hurt. Nick Foles picks up the pieces and then guides them to a Super Bowl victory and win Super Bowl MVP. So do you feel like that's, again the Eagles kind of learning from recent their recent past in drafting a guy like Jalen Hurts to come in there as well in the second round? Yeah, Red, I, th I think it's really interesting uh, the way backup quarterbacks are viewed. Like backup quarterbacks are kind of um, not nearly in front of – they rarely are in your front of mind until you absolutely need them. And going back to what you pointed out about the Indianapolis Colts and Curtis Painter, um, yeah. there's a thought that it doesn't really matter. If you lose your starting quarterback, the season is season's over so, anyway, right? So, so why do we need to invest in that position? Whereas some teams are like, no, 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 no. We need to get a guy that can win. He doesn't need to be a franchise quarterback that can carry the weight for 16 games. But if he can give us four or five games and we can kind of build around a redeemable quality, maybe that can get us three and two enough to offset an injury. And I think that is critical. And so when we think about the Philadelphia Eagles and Carson Wentz, the last three seasons, their season has ended with Carson Wentz being injured. ACL yeah. injury, back injury, uh, playoff game, first quarter concussion. Yep. And you can make the argument that if they had a better backup in the playoffs, maybe they win. And not, not disrespectful to Josh McCown, but Josh McCown was 40 and he got hurt in that game. Maybe if they have a young quarterback – who has a different skill set that maybe requires Doug Peterson to have a separate game? Plan. Sudfeld. Right. Sorry. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Sud, 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 Sudfeld was hurt. My God. He's hurt. I He's know. hurt. I know. He's hurt. I know. He was hurt. But, um, but in saying that, like, and saying that because he still has an opportunity to be the backup quarterback. But sure. if you invest in a backup quarterback, you develop him to the point that he can play. Ultimately, you would like the guy, if he gets a chance to go in there, to be able to just be serviceable to be a capable sure. backup that can get you out of games and maybe handle a couple of games and if you have that you have an opportunity to continue to stay afloat when your starting quarterback goes down and look you can always go the bill belichick route right um you know and if if you develop a guy like jalen hurts and he oh. and he plays mm -hmm. a little bit and showcases his talents and, and you know maybe you can flip it you know for another second or third down the road um like uh the, the patriots did with jimmy garoppolo and with jacoby Brissett. uh so you know, I also, as I'm looking at teams and kind of looking at strategies, the Panthers, I, I, I guess, you know, I know that Matt Rule said that they went into that draft knowing that they wanted to upgrade the defense, considering where they went with free agency, where they focused a little bit more on the offensive side of things. So I still think it's just crazy uh, to look at the fact that they went all defense, all defense in this draft. And just knowing that that they had a defensive player on their board that was top of the list every time their pick came up, um, but it certainly speaks to the the philosophy that they have there. Yeah, it does speak to the philosophy, and I think um, DJ and I interviewed Matt Rule last year when he's with Baylor, and I think MTS listeners, if they listen back to that podcast when he's on, he kind of outlined what he believes in. He believes in speed, 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 and explosiveness. And when I look at the players that they pick. Derrick Brown is an explosive player at the point of attack. He does a great job of dominating against the run game, gives you a little pass rush value. Your two are gross mottos 
is explosive off the edge. I believe he reminds me a little bit of Jason Pierre-Paul. Then you think about Jeremy Chin being able to run and chase and make plays, um, Kenny Robinson being a natural ball hawk, and those things. They took a number of guys that can up the athleticism and speed on their defense, give them some playmaking ability, and give them a chance to eventually compete in the NFC South. Yeah, and lastly here, before we get into some of the uh, impact uh, rookie classes as a whole for 2020, um, I, I thought the Cardinals selecting Isaiah Simmons – at number eight was pretty interesting as well because they obviously had a need there at right tackle. Jedrick Will still on the board could have been an easy selection there, one that we had talked about a lot. But what does the selection of Isaiah Tom? I'm sorry, Isaiah Simmons. Uh, I've got the last dance on my mind here with Isaiah. Yeah. Uh, Isaiah Simmons. What does that tell you about how they see themselves competing with the teams in their own division? Well, I think the the, the first thing, the first rule of thumb when you're building your team is you have to build your team to win your division. So you have to be able to look around a division and look at who are the top teams? How do we match up with those teams? And I think it's obvious when you look at the San Francisco 49ers being the team that won the division, the team that went to the Super Bowl, one person that you have to be able to match up with is George Kittle. And yeah. he is a tough matchup for most teams because they don't have a linebacker that can run with them and they don't typically have safeties that are big enough to deal with the physicality. Well, in Isaiah Simmons, they have a guy that, in theory, they can line up, have him walk up on the tight end, and you take Kittle and take him out the game. That helps. He also gives them a space player, meaning a sideline-to-sideline player to deal with Russell Wilson. Mm -hmm. Russell Wilson's athleticism, his ability to make these impro improvisational plays, you have to have someone that can match him and make him uncomfortable when he does decide to leave the pocket. Isaiah Simmons gives them that eraser that most teams are looking for in this new era in the National Football League. You know what? Let's let's actually finish this up because I, I I started talking at the top of this part of the conversation by mentioning the Ravens had the easiest schedule uh, in the league. You know who has the toughest schedule in the league? Who? The Patriots. The Patriots. The oh, Patriots yeah. have the toughest schedule in football this year based on uh, the combined record of their opponents a season ago. So how how do we then assess what the Patriots did in free agency and which was you know not a whole lot saw a couple of their players leave they locked up uh, locked up Devin McCourty, brought him back. they brought Joe Tooney back on the franchise tag. Um, and, and so there's some of those sort of things. And then looking at where they went in the draft, knowing one, they didn't, they didn't go quarterback and two, they didn't even really go receiver, although they did double down at the tight end spot. What does that tell you about, uh, the Patriot way moving forward? They certainly don't care about what we think on the outside. <laughs> um, they go about their business. They've always been an organization that's been really, really streamlined in terms of the number of players that they look at, uh, how they go about selecting their players. I think what this really tells me, I just believe that Bill Belichick figures that he can figure out anything when it comes to his team. And even though they're losing Tom Brady, the greatest of all time, I think we will see this team play like the Patriots teams in the early 2000s. Those teams were really collective units that played complimentary ball, um, didn't really have stars, um, Drew Blesso was certainly the starting quarterback, but once Tom Brady took over, that was a team that ran the ball. They threw to a bunch of no-name wide receivers. The defense kind of carried the way, and they won a ton of games, three out of four Super Bowls during that span. I think Bill Belichick is going to build that team. He's building this team kind of in their image. And I'll say this about Jared Stidham because everyone has questions and doubts about Jared Stidham and why would he entrust him. When I went back and I looked at the preseason, Jared Stidham had a really good preseason, really solid, like 67 completion rate, uh, maybe a four to one touchdown to interception uh, ratio. And when you saw them play with Stidham, a little more movement, a lot more play action from traditional two back sets. And when he does spread it out, he does a good job of getting the ball out of his hands. I absolutely believe you'll see the Patriots lean on the running game, but this will be a team that does it like they did it way back in 2000. I still think they're one of the toughest teams to defeat because they yeah. have so much know-how when it comes to winning. 
Yeah, and uh, just looking at uh, at Kyle Duggar out of Lenore Ryan, you know, Division II school, obviously uh, was one of the darlings of the pre-draft process from his performance at the Senior Bowl and at the Combine and uh, and all the run-up in his tape. You know, and you know he was clearly the best player on the field in a lot of those games uh, that you watched from Lenore Ryan, Mm -hmm. but he still represents a bit of a risk, which I think also fits within the Belichick drafting profile. That second round has been a huge risk round for the Patriots. I mean, they've swung and missed on a number of defensive backs. It's where they got Rob Gronkowski. Didn't even play in his final season at Arizona. They ended up getting him there, and that obviously worked out. But but Duggar's still a bit of a risk. I mean, he's obviously a great athlete, right? But uh, and, and some versatility there with how they want to use him. But you're still projecting. Oh, you absolutely are projecting. I mean, it's a huge pro- projection. One, it's, it's, always, it's always a projection when you're dealing with rookies and how they would transition. You're trying to speculate. How long will it take for them uh, to get comfortable and let their talent shine? But it's an even bigger jump for a guy coming from Lenore Ryan, small school competition, was probably the best guy on the field every time he stepped onto the field. <laughs> different game, different ball game. He is a remarkable athlete. He has tremendous uh, physical ability, but how long would it take him to settle in? So it is a bit of a risk. The thing about the draft and what is funny and fascinating about the draft, when you sit in meetings, a lot of times team executives will say this, and we always say it privately. Uh, the guys that you're really counting on are the guys that are really selected the first two days. Yeah. Um, most drafts are judged by how did your first round, your second round, and your third round do. But really, your first round, those guys need to be immediate contributors, starters. Your second round guys should be key contributors kind of in the mix. And then your third round guys are these guys that, have potential to start, but it may take a year or so. Anything beyond that from the team side, they're talking developmental guys. So when guys come from the fourth, fifth, and sixth round and they play and play really well early, it is a huge surprise, not only to the to the outside world, but to the team itself. 